For a while now, we've been exploring many Disney projects through the life of designer John Hench. In our last episode, we drifted a little way from the direct experience of Hench himself to look at Epcot the City, as the Epcot project would create a context for the projects that John Hench worked on later in his life. In this episode, we continue with our discussion of Walt's city, and we also take a look at another project that Walt was pursuing in 1966, a ski resort in the California Sierras at a location called Mineral King. It is these unbuilt projects that frame the last months of Walt's life and push Wed and the Disney designers such as Hench outside of the cinematic and theme park experiences that had defined their early years. By summer, it was clear. Walt was struggling with his health, mostly discomfort that he still believed was related to an old polo injury. Quote, he was going into the hospital to have his back looked into. His son-in-law, Ron Miller, recalled, I noticed he was having a hell of a time with his leg. The pain came down and it bothered his hip. Outside of family members, WED artists also recognized the change that had come over Walt in recent months. Quote, he felt lousy, Dick Irvine explained. He had this terrific pain in his neck, and he used to complain about it. He went into St. John's out here in Santa Monica, and then went over to UCLA. UCLA recommended that Walt be x-rayed, but as Irvine explained, quote, he skipped his lung x-rays at that time. They said that they knew what it was, it was an old polo injury, and they could correct it. He didn't have to do it right away, he could pick his own time, so he selected the fall to do that. Irvine would later explain how he knew such detailed information about Walt's medical procedures, information that went beyond that of others central to WED. Quote, the reason I know that he missed the x-rays, Irvine said, was that my daughter was working out there at UCLA at the time. She went up from x-ray to take him down in a wheelchair with another little girl, and Walt refused to go, and that was the morning that he checked out of UCLA. These events together suggest that doctors already suspected that Walt's discomfort extended beyond an old injury, as a chest x-ray focused on the lungs would have exceeded the usual exploratory scope for an athletic injury. The story also suggests that Walt, in delaying the x-ray, may have sensed the seriousness of his underlying condition. Lastly, it suggests that, in some way, Walt was choosing to ignore his medical condition so that treatment wouldn't interfere with two projects he wanted to solidify before he took time off from work. Those projects were Mineral King and Epcot. But the choice to delay the x-ray and therefore treatment may have had dire consequences for Walt, allowing his condition to worsen and as a result, perhaps shortening his life by months or even years. As with the Florida Project, the land rights for the Mineral King Ski Resort proved difficult, not only in creating a plan that would exceed the comfort levels of other resorts, but also in acquiring the land. Most of the Mineral King land, high in the California Sierras, was owned and managed by the U.S. Forest Service, except for two isolated plots. One of those plots, five acres in total, was home to a dozen summer cabins, including one that was used as a small convenience store, cafe, and gathering spot. Disney now owned this land and planned to build the ski village there as they could fully manage these five acres outside of a forestry department lease. Another 20-acre plot, previously a mining claim, was located on the side of the mountain. Disney now owned that land as well, though there was little they could develop there. To create the entire resort with ski lifts, roads, hiking areas, and electric transportation, the project would need to be approved by the U.S. Forest Service, which managed the majority of land Walt hoped to use. By this point, Disney designers had loosely planned out a development at the north end of the valley, featuring a, quote, 
completely self-contained village, including a chapel, ice skating rink, convenience shops, restaurants, conference center, and low-cost lodging accommodations. The Walt initially had rejected fantasy-style entertainment for this nature-focused resort. He now reconsidered that plan, believing that some small piece of imaginative entertainment might be appropriate indoors. Quote, after the preliminary Mineral King contract had been signed, recalled wood designer Wethel Rogers, Walt had an idea for entertainment after people had been skiing. What we're going to do, he said, is to have a bear band and to have them perform two or three programs of entertainment. We'll say that the bears had come out of the sequoias and we trained them to be entertainers. Outside of the village, 14 ski lifts would be arranged around 12 natural mountain bowls, lifts that could also be used by hikers and campers during the warmer months to access high altitude areas of natural beauty. As with Epcot, Walt wanted to exclude vehicles from the valley floor, asking guests to park in a 2,500 space parking structure at the entrance to the area, where an all-weather underground tramway adapted from the current wedway system would carry guests to the Alpine Village. The tram would accomplish two goals. It would minimize environmental damage that cars would bring to the valley, and it would present the resort as a pedestrian park similar to the Greenbelt in Epcot. By the summer of 1966, Walt was satisfied with the loose overview assembled by his design team, but he hoped to create a more nuanced master plan that would incorporate new technology and better design. Soil scientists from Dames and Moore, the same engineering firm presently working on the Florida site, were developing a study that would be used to identify lift and ski areas. As with previous projects, Walt believed that his WED designers would study, quote, European and Eastern resorts to see how many mistakes can be avoided by the Mineral King development. These research trips, similar to those performed for the creation of Disneyland and the development of Epcot, would ideally introduce new ideas into Walt's plan leading to a more sophisticated resort. By this time, there were three significant barriers that Walt needed to overcome before he could proceed with construction. First, the Walt had received a three-year preliminary permit from the Forest Service to survey the land and begin the planning process. He would need to obtain a 30-year lease before he engaged a construction project. His current permit would expire in January 1969, so he had roughly two and a half years to finalize plans and have them approved by the Forest Service. Second, he needed to convince the residents of the nearest town, the unincorporated area of Three Rivers, that a Disney resort would prove a boon to their community, that it would bring prosperity and wouldn't damage the natural beauty of the region. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, he needed the state to build a 26-mile all-weather modern highway to connect three rivers to the proposed parking structure at Mineral King. Presently, all that connected Mineral King to Three Rivers was a narrow access road containing so many cliffside turns that, according to locals, quote, the maximum safe speed at any spot is 20 miles per hour. The proposed highway, built in mountain areas prone to deep snow, would take four to five years to complete, assuming it was approved and funded by the state. Quote, if the road to Mineral King were open today, Walt said, we could be operating in two years. The primary sticking point was the $25 million cost of road construction, which ideally would be absorbed by the state, perhaps with some assistance from the federal government. But funding remained a problem. The deputy state highway engineer repeatedly explained that, quote, there are many needed projects in Southern California for which there are not sufficient funds, suggesting that the state was unlikely to spend so much on a single road that primarily serviced a privately developed recreation complex. To solve this problem, Walt would need to do one of those things that he did very well convince a skeptical audience that a Disney plan would be advantageous for all of those involved. 
The Disney company estimated that the Mineral King Resort would produce a gross annual income of $22 million, with $650,000 going back to the Forest Service. Already, real estate around Three Rivers had risen in value by 600 to 800 percent. One local service station bought for $2,000 in 1964 recently sold for 8000 merely on the news that Disney might build there. Beyond the policy barriers, the Disney company faced a small but growing opposition from the Sierra Club. Disney hoped that any environmental concerns would be overcome as plans developed. Mass transportation would limit the use of cars, the ski areas were mostly free of timber, and the location for the village presently held a cluster of family cabins, buildings that would be replaced with better structures. Though the resort would attract higher visitor loads, the Disney team hoped to convince environmentalists that their resort, like a national park, would allow a wide range of people to experience and appreciate nature. By early September, Disney was moving toward an agreement with the state concerning the highway and arranged a press event at Mineral King to announce the news. Governor Edmund Brown, heading into an election cycle, could use the opportunity to highlight his leadership in expanding business and civic institutions within the state. Under Brown, the state had built 11 public universities and finished a thousand miles of freeway. A Disney ski resort would be yet another project, started under his watch, that would expand the offerings of the Golden State. For its part, Disney could use the event to build public interest in the proposed resort and also to highlight their sincerity about preserving the natural beauty of Mineral King while providing access for the public through limited development. As average daily high temperatures in September hovered in the low to mid 30s, the Disney team arranged the luncheon event for midday when hopefully it was at least sunny, ideally above freezing. Though the governor would arrive by helicopter, everyone else, including roughly 50 members of the press, would arrive by car, each of them moving up the cliff-lined road to reach a valley nestled between peaks. On Monday, September 19th, Walt, again feeling tired, arrived early along with a handful of Disney executives, including Vice President Card Walker. Initially, the presentation was scheduled to start at 11.30 a.m., followed by a lunch of chicken and beans prepared in one of the existing cabins. But by mid-morning, the wind had increased and clouds had darkened the sky, intermittently dropping a light slushy snow around the encampment. In the cabin, used as a store and cafe, a fire was lit so guests could warm themselves. Walt waited for the governor, again feeling fatigue well up inside him. The altitude perhaps intensified his exhaustion. But others noticed that he seemed more tired than usual. Repeatedly, Disney execs checked the sky, wondering if the governor would be able to land. But then, despite strong gusts, the helicopter touched down nearly 90 minutes late. Once on the ground, the governor was met by 50 members of the press asking questions and snapping photos. After the governor waved hello, he approached Walt and said that he was hungry and cold, suggesting that they start lunch before speaking to the press. Walt said, I'm cold. But instead of beginning lunch, Walt sat down to talk with the governor while the press leaned in. Walt was dressed in a white jacket and felt hat, an outfit nearly identical to the one he had worn at the Olympics six years earlier. Though the man Walt had been back then was now gone, replaced by a person who struggled to appear energetic. Along with Card Walker, Walt showed the governor plans that included preliminary locations for the ski runs, as sketched out by ski expert Willie Schaeffler. Everyone there could see that it would be a magnificent resort, something worthy of world-class athletes. Speaking to the press, Governor Brown pledged that the state would move forward with plans to create a modern highway leading to Mineral King. Quote, I have discussed a project with Eugene Foley, Assistant Secretary of Commerce, he said, and I can tell you, we are going ahead with the road. 
In terms of the project's priority, a state engineer added that if financing were in place, quote, the state can call for bids on the road project in the latter part of 1968 with the expectation that three years of construction work would bring completion. The governor also said that he had, quote, verbal assurance that the U.S. Forest Service would cooperate with the Disney plan. As for Disney's immediate plans, Walt explained that his company would develop a small lodge for an initial work crew who would move into the valley the following summer. He explained that a few ski runs might be opened before the road was finished for expert or professional skiers, perhaps even as an exclusive practice area for the 1968 U.S. Olympics team. Signaling that the initial presentation was coming to a close, Governor Brown announced that the road, quote, will give access to the nation's finest recreational center in the heart of majestic mountain scenery. If Walt Disney has a staggering imagination, the impact of Mineral King on the California economy is going to be equally staggering. Once the formal announcement was over, Walt walked over to a kitchen where he was served a plate of beans and chicken. Together, he and the governor relaxed in a cabin where they continued to talk. As the road project partially depended on federal funds not yet secured, the Disney team asked what would happen if the state couldn't secure full funding, to which the governor said that a financial shortfall could be covered by making it a toll road, though that would be a last resort. Toward the end of the event, speaking to a few reporters, the governor said, quote, I hope that in 10 years from today, I can stand here as governor, I might add, with Walt Disney again and look around at the wonderland that will have been created. In terms of solidifying support and presenting a positive image of the proposed resort, the event was a success. But those around Walt remained concerned for his health, as clearly he was in a state of decline. At one point, Walt sought refuge of the cafe cabin with its fireplace, where he sank into a chair, trying to gather his strength before he went outside to be photographed with the governor. Quote, Walt's complexion was ashen, Disney publicist Robert Jackson recalled, and this was the first time that I became truly worried about his well-being. In a very quiet manner, Walt asked me to delay the photos for a few minutes until I can catch my breath and can rest a while. Walt came outside a few minutes later and posed with Governor Brown. The photos, or at least some of them, showed Walt happy to be in the mountains, working on another project, one that would improve the quality for many of a vacation in the High Sierras. During these same months, despite his ailing health, Walt worked on a number of projects. He developed plans to create an arts college near Los Angeles, one that looked particularly to the needs of the studios. He oversaw the animated feature, The Jungle Book, and the musical, The Happiest Millionaire. He reviewed marketing campaigns for the live-action film, Follow Me, Boys. But the lion's share of his attention was still directed toward his city. By September, the Epcot design team had arranged the elements Walt wanted in his city into a unified plan. Quote, the plot plan, Joe Potter explained, was finished and presented in 1966, which laid out the city by neighborhoods and districts. The city, beyond a practical urban space, was now a rebuff to critics who claimed that the type of art produced by Disney merely allowed people to escape the troubles of their daily lives. Though these critics discounted the necessity of escapist art and cultures focused on work, they were able to pigeonhole much of the Disney output after Fantasia and the War as pleasurable diversions. Even Disneyland was arranged as a type of escapist fantasy in which guests were visually removed from the troubles of the urban world. Beneath this critique was a question. Instead of creating escapist fantasies, why didn't Walt help create a better world so that escape from social problems wasn't necessary? Epcot was Walt's answer, a project that through example suggested that escapist art in its best moments 
could move beyond pleasurable fantasies to projects that existed beyond a theater or a theme park and improve the ongoing daily lives of millions. In this, Walt saw Epcot as central to his legacy. With a finished plot plan, the Disney team was able to engage discussions with the state government of Florida about concessions they would need to develop both the resort and the city. Bob Foster, after overseeing the land purchase, became the liaison between the Disney company and state officials. Quote, we presented the legislation in September 1966 to the Florida legislature, Foster explained. But early discussions with government officials provoked a new set of questions beyond construction and use, specifically, how would the city be governed? This was yet another consideration that the Disney team needed to layer into their plans. As with films and the parks, Walt decided that to preserve quality, he wanted to control the city rather than grant decision-making rights to those who lived there. Quote, there will be no landowners, Walt explained, and therefore no voting control. People will rent homes instead of buying them at modest rentals. There will be no retirees. Everyone must be employed. One of our requirements is that the people who live in Epcot must help keep it alive. In this, Epcot looked even more like a company town, one where residents each had a role in transforming Walt's dream of an interconnected community to life. During these months, Foster lobbied state members of Congress, explaining in clear language what Walt hoped to achieve. He invited members of the Florida state government, including the comptroller, to the Disney studio and to WED so they might better understand how the theme park, resort, and city would be developed and constructed. Quote, the objective was, Foster said, to demonstrate that some of their regulations in Florida did not apply as they had suggested to a highly experimental and imaginative development. In other words, Foster wanted government officials to see firsthand existing building codes wouldn't cover the type of projects regularly engaged by Disney. Quote, there was nothing in the Orange and Osceola County zoning ordinances that could remotely apply to Disney World as a total project, Foster said. These trips helped establish Disney's need to receive special concessions and broad powers concerning building codes and zoning rights, as well as the ability to create company-supported utilities. The utility needs of the Disney development, Foster pointed out, were beyond those that could be reasonably provided by the two counties where the Disneyland was located. Over months, Foster advocated that the Disney development should be viewed as a type of self-supporting, self-regulated city, one that would almost surely become a significant income-generating entity for the region. Zoning ordinances and building codes in most cities, he explained, were largely arranged to encourage peace among neighbors, establish a sense of fair play between businesses, and regulate order in urban areas where many individuals held small adjoining pieces of land. But what was the purpose of imposing those same rules onto a tract of land twice the size of Manhattan owned by a single company? In these presentations, Foster was engaging and persuasive, offering a clear rationale as to why Disney should be granted broad control over the land. But as he was only a mid-level company representative, his words did not have the power of a company president. From the start, Walt understood that at some point he would need to explain to the Florida legislature why his company needed these unique powers. Though Foster might lay the groundwork for policy concessions, Walt would need to close the deal. In September, Walt gathered a handful of company executives into a projection room at the studio, along with Bob Foster and Joe Potter, to formally present the plot plan and city proposal he had developed at WED with Marvin Davis and others. Though most at this meeting understood Epcot's general concept, this was the first time that they saw street by street, building by building, how the city would be assembled. At this meeting, Walt also explained how he would approach the Florida legislature. He would make his pitch 
through film, a format that could easily integrate visuals with narration, a format that also, though he didn't mention this, could edit out coughing fits that seized him now when he spoke at length. Film, he felt, was the best avenue for this particular presentation. To shape this film, Walt looked to a young writer named Marty Scalar. For years, Walt had worked with Scalar on speeches and scripts that framed the narration for his weekly TV series. Through them, Scalar had developed a knack for identifying and using patterns of speech that Walt felt natural, inviting, and at times persuasive. Though the content for the film would be developed by the designers who had worked on Epcot, Scalar would arrange the information into a narration script that would form the basis of Walt's half-hour presentation on screen. Quote, I don't know how many meetings I had with Walt, Scalar said, but I have extensive notes from those meetings. His philosophy, what he wanted to communicate, his constant repetition of meets the needs of people. In all, Scalar assembled seven thickly inked pages of notes that he would use to create the shooting script for the half-hour film. Many elements that Walt wanted to talk about related to those ideas in transportation, such as the monorail and the wedway, along with road systems that kept cars away from pedestrians. Beyond this, Scalar's notes were peppered with the conceptual underpinnings of Epcot. One note read, quote, the philosophy behind Epcot is the same as at Disneyland. People will be king. Another read, quote, Epcot's starting point, the needs of the people, transportation, education, and so on. The notes, when converted into narration, would invite viewers to imagine themselves living in Walt City with their desires and needs fulfilled in new ways, with advanced technology and innovative design creating a more satisfying way of life. By this point, Walt was already scheduled for surgery shortly after finishing the Epcot film, and as such, he wanted to arrange the film for multiple audiences in case his recovery took longer than planned. Quote, he asked me to write two endings, Scalar said. One was aimed directly at audiences in the state of Florida because the state's legislature was debating passage of a law that would establish the Reedy Creek Improvement District, RCID, a key to Walt's plans for Epcot as an experimental community. The law would give the RCID the power to establish building codes and zoning regulations. The second ending for the film was aimed at potential corporate sponsors. Beyond those that were formally named, others on the Disney team already saw, or would soon see, a third audience, local government officials in Orange and Osceola counties, as they too would need to support the project with road developments and other area improvements. With a plot plan finished. The Epcot team focused almost entirely on the film, working to create an effective visual message that would persuade government officials and business leaders. As the message would be both spoken and visual, Walt looked to others beyond Scalar to craft other aspects of the presentation. Quote, I did a lot of people mover sketches for Walt. George McGinnis explained. These would not only be featured in the film, but would be placed on the wall behind Walt as he spoke to the camera. Quote, a large painting I did of the international area was used in the film, McGinnis added, and it showed Scottish bagpipers and dancers with the monorail in the background. For years, a production team had shot the weekly intro segment for Walt's TV show on a soundstage featuring a recreation of Walt's office. The mock office, designed by wed artist Stan Jolly, had become Walt's on-screen home. Now, studio craftspeople created a second mock office on a soundstage, a version of the Florida room with its high ceilings and open design areas where Walt, Marvin Davis, and others had worked for months to create plans for Epcot. The planning maps and aerial photos were moved from the wet office in Glendale to the studio soundstage in Burbank. A studio crew dressed the set with furniture similar to that used at WED. Now, all that was left was for Walt to practice his lines, to rehearse his delivery, and to find a way 
despite moments of pain and fog that occasionally darkened his thoughts, so that he could connect to those on the other side of the camera, to those who would later watch this film, to better understand the wonders he wanted to build in Florida. Before I go today, a couple of things. We're moving up on the 50th anniversary of Walt Disney World. The Florida Resort opened to the public on October 1st, 1971. So next week, we'll take a special look at how the resort was developed in those final months leading to its opening. It's something that I've been working on for a while. Also, as you probably know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. If you enjoy these episodes, if you find them a meaningful part of your week, please support us by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes. But the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link in the show notes. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.